see a couple of people, but uh, I do believe we have our quorum, so we'll carry on. We're waiting on, I assume, Katie and Terry and Jennifer. So, and my clock says it's seven here. oh one. Terry's here. Katie and awesome. Jennifer are not yet. Okay. Oh, Katie's here. Sorry, Welcome, I'm late. Katie. No, no worries. All right. Uh, so we'll call the meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional land of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which is represented by the communities of Saugeen First Nation and Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. We also think of the Métis Nation of Ontario, whose history and people are well represented in Bruce and Gray County. And we have not received any regrets tonight. Is that correct, Bev? That's correct. Thank you. So for our moment of reflection uh, for tonight, March 22nd, I hope everyone had an excellent March break. For our students and staff, it is always an ideal opportunity to take a well-deserved pause, to recharge and spend some time engaging in fun learning activities beyond the classroom. Now that spring has officially begun, there is a renewed energy and sense of excitement in our Blue Water District School Board schools. With the easing of certain COVID-19 restrictions, students and staff have been busy preparing for field trips um, and the welcome return of sports and extracurricular activities. After a lengthy two years, schools are starting to adjust, I hope, to a more normal pre-pandemic way of life. Though despite this gradual return to a sense of stability, we still find ourselves in uncertain times. Many in our Bruce and Gray communities continued to be shocked and saddened by the recent events in Ukraine. The global impact of such a volatile situation can certainly be felt here at home, including in our schools and work sites. For this month's moment of reflection, I invite you to join me as we open our hearts and send thoughts to those directly affected by the ongoing crisis in Ukraine which extends to any local residents and families with close ties overseas. We wish for their safety and well-being while remaining hopeful for a peaceful resolution. It gave me a chill as I said that. Um, um, the approval of the agenda could I have a mover that the agenda for the regular meeting of the board of March 22nd, 2022 be approved as printed? I see Trustee McComb is the mover and Trustee Dawson as the seconder. Um, all in favor of the agenda as it's printed. Thank you, that's carried. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest on any of the agenda items on our agenda this evening? Trustee Morgan, I see your hand is still up, but I'm suspecting that's a sluggish hand. You are absolutely right. I am so sorry. No worries. Um, so the approval of our regular meeting of the board minutes, we have two sets of minutes to approve. Uh, that goes back to February 15th of 2022. I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder that the minutes of the regular meeting of the board of February 15th, 2022 be approved as printed. Trustee Atkinson. And a seconder. Trustee Boyd John, thank you. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. And our second uh, minutes that we're moving tonight is the minutes of the Committee of the Whole Board from March 1st, um, 2022. Could I have a mover and seconder that the minutes of the Committee of the Whole Board meeting of March 1st, 
1st, 2022 be approved as printed. I see Trustee Johnstone and Trustee McComb. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Uh, is there any business arising from the minutes? So we're to our first, our excellence in education for this evening. And I'd like to invite Superintendent of Education, Elliot, uh, to speak to this report. But while we put it on the floor, I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board receive the System Specialized Technology Team report for information. Could I have a mover? I see Trustee McComb and Trustee Morgan. Thank you. And welcome, Superintendent Elliott. Good evening. It is my pleasure to honor the excellence of our specialized technology team. This team works diligently to ensure that students with special education needs have the tools necessary to access curriculum and maximize their learning. They oversee training and monitoring to support our students who require technology to access the curriculum. Their expertise and commitment provides students with the opportunity to maximize learning and achieve success. I welcome Melissa McEwen, Learning Services Administrator, to introduce our team. Welcome, Melissa. Good evening, everyone. Chair Thompson and trustees, it is my pleasure this evening to have the opportunity to introduce you to an exemplary team we have in Blue Water. Um, this team exemplifies how collaborative teamwork positively benefits students and staff. And tonight, I will uh, begin with some introductions. So we do have on this team, Pam Newcomb, Communicative Disorders Assistant, Tanya Schlosser, System Special Education Instructional Lead Teacher, Michelle Steven, Specialized Technology and Learning Teacher, Crystal Stoby, Communicative Disorders Assistant. And I'm pleased that all were able to join us for this recognition this evening. At this point, I will turn things over to Tanya, who will share information with you about how specialized technology is supported in Blue Water District School Board, and specifically how it has the ability to positively impact outcomes for students. Tanya? Perfect. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here and hope everything works the way it's supposed to. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Looks great. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So good evening everyone. As Melissa said, we are the System Specialized Technology Team and we are very happy to be here. Uh, we support students and staff in using assistive technology in the classroom and we just wanted to be able to tell you a little bit more about that. So last spring our team started to revise the Blue Water District School Board's uh, Special Equipment Amount or SIA policy and procedure to align with the update from the Ministry of Education's SIA guideline document. So we fo focused on questions like, how can we better support teachers directly in the classroom? How can we normalize technology in the classroom environment? How can we ensure that technology will continue to be used to support student learning, not just in one year or one classroom, but for an entire lifetime? After a lot of iterations, and brainstorming and discussions within our team and in consultation with other system staff and learning resource teachers, we ended up completely revamping our procedure. So the new procedure helps to reduce paperwork and tasks for school teams while it provides support for both staff and students and gets computers into the hands of students who need them more quickly. We wanted a way to empower schools in supporting students on their own while recognizing that the technology team is here to assist when needed. We created two different paths, a consultation path and an intervention block path. Although we are very proud of both of our paths, we want to share the very exciting intervention block path with you in more detail tonight. The intervention block is a two day per week, four week model. Each school identifies two to three classes for the block and three to five targeted students within each class. Target students are students that the school team feels might benefit from regular access to technology for reading and writing, as well as some individual support. So we begin our block with our planning. 
the school team and the technology team discusses the profiles of the targeted students, current technology experience and use in the classroom, and what the classroom teacher is hoping to accomplish in the following days. Next is six in-class sessions that vary in length based on the number of classrooms that we're supporting in the school. During the sessions, Michelle and I have led lessons and co-taught with the teacher, modeled how to make work electronic, support student learning as the technology is integrated into the regular classroom day and regular subjects. Our CDAs, Pam and Crystal, typically join us in the last couple of sessions in the block so that they can meet the students that we believe will continue to need support after we're finished. The block closes with a day to debrief and plan on next steps. Next steps could be SIA claims or loaner devices or recommendations to keep using school technology. It all depends on the students' needs and skills at the time. And one of the best supports that the team brings is 10 loaner computers that stay at the school for the entire four weeks that helps to support consistent technology access for the students. We chose to target grades four to six for these blocks as our team has found that junior grades are ideal for starting to use technology to access curriculum. Students are generally more independent with the technology skills and they're keen and they're more willing to use without the fear of looking different. We also have had a few lucky grade seven, eight students who have snuck into the process because of split grade classes. The blocks have been absolutely amazing for both staff and student development. Teachers report feeling confident moving forward with technology in their classrooms now that they have had the supported time to practice with their students. Students that we felt at the beginning of the blocks maybe weren't quite ready for technology often grew and flourished with the extra practice and the coaching within the classroom with their peers. And you'll know, notice these are many quotes that we have had from some of the, uh, the teachers that have been involved in the blocks. I have a short clip here of classroom teacher Adriana Wilson from Walkerton District Community School. Her grade six class was our very first block and they were an amazing group of students. She shares her thoughts with me at the end of the block and just note that she says technology block at the beginning saying she's done this before, but she really means technology trial like in the old process. So hopefully our sound works. So I've done a technology block a couple times before and in the past what it looked like would be um, students would be pulled one-on-one, -on -one. sorry, it would start with the teacher being pulled at the beginning of the session and kind of showing some programs and some ways to do things and then the students would be pulled one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and while this was good for individual support, I struggled as a teacher because I wasn't using it, I, I didn't see it used right in the classroom that first day, that first time. So having um, having it happen right in the classroom was a really great learning experience for me and the kids uh, because it was kind of like we could troubleshoot everything straight away together. Mm -hmm. And and having Tanya there being like, oh yes, I've got this person from IT and we can sort that out right away. So that was really great because I was learning the programs alongside with the students and seeing how they they uh, use the programs. Along with that, when uh, there was a couple weeks before we would see each other again, so every time my my technology kids got onto the computers, they and, and anything that came up, I would just start writing a list and be like, okay, so this is something and this. So then it was great because then when Tanya came back, I'd be like, okay, well these things happened in the in, in the times where the kids were getting on the computer. So it was awesome. We could then troubleshoot that and. I feel like we developed their skills really quickly mm -hmm. because those roadblocks weren't there and because it was constantly we were having we were having visits and they had access all the time with the with the loaner computers. Yeah, exactly. Having those five loaner computers were awesome and also it was nice because it normalized it in the classroom like at no point did my other students see that oh well why are they getting computers? It was just kind of like oh that's that's what they did to 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 complete this task and we're completing it a different way and everybody mm -hmm. it, it really normalized it so that was that was great sure. um yeah and it was it was just i thought it was really essential to have that extra support while we were doing things in the classroom it was yeah it was it was fun it was fun, <laughs> it, was fun. it was so much fun and i uh, yeah the kids the kids are flying they're they're doing awesome with it now and they're so much more independent than i've ever seen them in, yeah. in and, the con and confident yes. confident in their abilities yeah yeah sure. so that's my two cents <laughs>
so. So the students in each of the block classrooms have been so receptive to using the technology and the built in assistive tools. Having tools like dictation and read aloud on the regular Microsoft programs and available to all the students helps to normalize the use. Michelle and I also learned that some of the assistive tools that we sometimes recommend to teachers in a one on one setting aren't always the best tool in every situation or for every student, and we've had to be able to adjust on the fly and suggest something different to meet student need. So this is my friend Olivia. She's in grade four and she's demonstrating how to use the technology uh, to support her reading and written output. Her parent told me that she had started to get really discouraged with school, but now with her technology, she's been able to teach her peers and it's been a real confidence booster for her. <laughs> so Olivia uses technology for all kinds of stuff. You use it for reading and you use it for writing. Um, so how does it help you with your reading? It helps because it reads to me and sometimes it helps me like figure out one word. Okay, good. You have to hit this microphone, this speak and I'm going to that beach and that red little circle. And it keeps on writing the words I'm saying. And then if it won't stop until I hit it again. Excellent. Hit this button and then you hold it down and you just make a big square. And then you let it think. Please choose an insect to research. Pick one that you are interested in, but don't have a lot of knowledge about. Your mm -hmm. final project will contain. So if your teacher said, hey, Olivia, go and write this with a pencil. Would that work very well? No. No? How come? Because it's a computer and, well, sometimes it's not fast and and it's not really, I guess, fun sometimes. It's not fun? Is writing with a pencil hard sometimes? So the computer you think is your just right tool? Mm -hmm. And you're looking forward to having a computer for a long, long time? Mm-hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Anything else you like about computers? Well, I like how it reads to me. I like how it dictates. I like how I can play games on it. I like how I can learn on it. There's a lot of stuff I can do on it. There is a lot of stuff. And you are awesome at teaching your friends in your class. You're kind of the expert, aren't you? Well, I did this last year. <laughs> <laughs> I like the confidence. <laughs> Uh, for the next couple of slides, please note that we changed some names to protect, uh, protect confidentiality. So at one school, Kate was quiet and reserved. Her confidence grew by leaps and bounds once she was able to listen to text at her own grade level and also produce written output with dictation. She became the technology leader in her classroom and proudly assisted her peers who had questions about certain tools. Her teacher told me that she told him she was so happy to have a computer because she said now she can do her homework all by herself and her mom doesn't have to read and write for her. Pam reports that her eagerness and her independence has her well equipped to access and produce grade level material. At another school, Brett often acted out in class and never handed in work. He made a dramatic change once he was provided with technology. He would proudly show his completed work to me and had even begun to write his own short story. His teacher was completely blown away at the change in his demeanor and his abilities. Crystal reports that after a couple of one on one sessions, he's ready to take on the world. All the students in the classes benefit from the experience, not just our target students. One student told me that showing him word prediction was a game changer because he explained that his speech impediment made dictation hard for him. Other students were excited to see us every day and would show us what they had discovered to do and tell us what they'd been using the technology for when they weren't there. During one particular block, we even discovered a student who needed technology to support his learning, but he hadn't been one of our targeted students. With a co-teaching approach from the adults and determination by the students, we were able to put a computer into his hands by the end of the block. As we reflect on our process and we look ahead to next year, we're reviewing our work to see where we can improve on our support and ensure that we're meeting both staff and student needs. 
We are compiling data about the schools who have not had many referrals in the past year, and we hope to invite them to join us for a block first next year. We know that there are lots of needs and we are excited to support. Technology can be life changing for some students, as we've mentioned tonight. Our team is so privileged to get to watch our students and staff members gain skills, learn new programs and achieve their goals. With our new model, our whole team has had a much more personal involvement and connection to both staff and students. Just stop sharing here. So at this time, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions for the team. I know I do, but I don't know if any of the other trustees do. <laughs> Trustee Morgan. Um, thank you, Chair Thompson. Um, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, please tell the students that we enjoyed seeing what they were doing and particularly the young man who was sitting under the desk i think that's a great place to sit and study <laughs> i'm all for it yes hmm. st dawson yeah thank you for that it's very informative to see how technology is helping these students and improving their attitude towards school that parent who reported about the change in her son to me really really spoke to me and i'd also like to thank the you for having the closed captioning on so we could actually read the words that the people were saying because you know with masks and so on it does make it difficult to hear everybody sometimes thank you are there any other questions or comments i had a couple of questions for you <laughs> Uh, first, I'm interested in how you, the leaders in this, learn about the new technology. What are the opportunities for you to learn to teach the rest of our staff? Um, I am involved in the Microsoft um, Educator Program, and that's something that a lot of the new pieces that come out um, are first launched. They have a number of different um, courses and quick videos and those sorts of things. I also have a number of contacts that are on uh, Twitter that I follow with Microsoft where I'm able to contact people to say what about this or what's new or what's happening and then I'm able to share that with the team. Um, we also have a lot of amazing, amazing teachers in our board who we learn things from them and we learn things from kids who who have discovered all kinds of interesting things. So it's a matter of really networking with our own schools, but networking outside of the schools and also uh, trying a lot of new things on our own. We do a lot of Googling. A lot of people think we know everything and we certainly don't. We do a lot of Googling to figure things out just like everyone else. Excellent. Now, I wondered if there was something more organized through the ministry, but that congratulations on all the work that you do. My other question was, uh, how do you feel uh, the funding is for the resources you need to provide for our students? I think at this time we, we have sufficient funding. Um, we've been very pleased that we've been able to um, purchase machines from Dell now instead of Lenovo as they are half the price. Um, they're working very, very well. We've With our loaner computers, we've been able to get out and about with those, those new computers and see how do they work in the classroom and if they're meeting the needs of the students. Um, I know anytime I've said to Melissa, we need to put in another order, she has said, let's do it. So we've been able to supply the students with what they need. Excellent. And I guess I, I heard uh, there's been a lot of conversation. And I know for the trustees benefit, we're going to have a presentation on it uh, coming forward about language and reading. Um, and I wonder how often we reassess the needs of students. Uh, do we find that they progress learning from this tool while they need it and then can move back into a system where they might uh, learn in a more conventional way so that when they graduate, they've got a variety of tools at their disposal? And it may not be today is the day to answer it. It may come forward at our next 
uh, when we talk about our language, but I just wondered if somebody might comment. Um, that's a good question. Melissa, do you want to comment on that one? <laughs> sure, I can comment. Um, I think that you've identified a, a key area, Jane. We have students who uh, are going to benefit from using some assistive technology, and that is going to be a support that allows them to close gaps and uh, achieve the curriculum. And at the same time, we need to be working on remediation around some of that uh, literacy development as it relates to reading and writing. So it's a um, multi-pronged approach to helping students with reading. And as you indicated, there is going to be further information that's going to be shared about the reading program. So I won't dive into that specifically, but I think there's always going to be a need to have um, multiple approaches in order to close those gaps for students. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I don't see any. I just want to thank you for taking us into the classroom for a little bit. We've all been uh, sitting on the outskirts for a long time. It's fun to see students. It's fun to watch what they're learning. And I appreciate that you've had the videos that take us right into those classrooms. So thank you so much for all of you for joining us tonight. Perfect. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It was moved by Trustee McComb and seconded by Trustee Morgan uh, that the Blue Water District School Board receive the system specialized technology team report for information. All in favor. Thank you, that's carried. We have no delegations this evening. And so we're to our reports, uh, the committee of the whole board report. Um, I would like to invite Vice Chair Johnstone to speak to this report as she chaired that meeting. Thank you. Um, I'm not actually going to speak to report because the report is actually just the three motions. <laughs> so if you'd like me to put the motions on the floor, I can. Chair Perfect, Thompson. yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, okay, well then I'll do that. Okay. Okay, so the first one is that the Blue Water District School Board approved that Gray Highlands Secondary School students participate in the France and England experience from October 6th to the 15th, 2023, contingent that it aligns with COVID-19 protocols and travel advisories at the time of departure. Can I have a, I see Trustee Dawson in a second, and thank you, Trustee McComb. Is there any ad additional comments or questions? Um, go ahead, Trustee Morgan. I would just like to comment again that I'm very pleased that this is a year out and that the students are taking time to raise money for an expensive trip. Thank you. And thank you. Is there any additional comments or questions concerning this trip? OK, I see none. All in favor? And that is carried and thank you very much. Next. Um, that the Blue Water District School Board approved that Georgian Bay Community School students participate in the Pursuits Program Tomogamy Field Trip from June 14th to the 27th, 2022. Contingent that it aligns with COVID-19 protocols at the time of departure. And can I have a thank you, Trustee Morgan is the a first mover and may I have a second? Mover, thank you to uh, Trustee Atkinson. Is there any questions or comments concerning the motion before you? Go ahead, Trustee Lutz. Yes, hi. On reviewing the information on this trip before this meeting, I noticed um, two concerns I have. The first is that there's an inconsistency where one form says that all students will pass the swim test before participating and then the next not only offers a way to challenge out but also says and i quote students who do not pass the swim test or who have been identified as non-swimmers may be permitted to canoe on a and then it goes into details of on a certain portion of the trip not 
only does that go against our uh, procedure for trips involving water. I would also like to point out that there is a past precedent from other school boards that would leave us criminally negligent if we allow students who have not passed a swim test to participate in a water-based field trip. Thank you. Uh, and I see that Superintendent Lafave is right there. So would you like to speak to that question and concern? Um, thank you. Um, I just want to assure um, all everyone that um, students that need to either pass the swim test or they have received the um, or they have their bronze medallion, bronze cross or national lifeguard certification um, as deemed um, suitable uh, through the OFIA um, guidelines that we follow. Um, could I just ask where where in the um, the package does it state? Um, I just I can't I can't seem to locate that where where it states that they do not have to pass the swim test. Um, so just a second, I took a screenshot. So just give me one second to find it because I couldn't keep my email open the whole time. So it is. Um, I apologize here. I was compiling too many different things, so it is. Oh, here we go. So it is in paragraph three. Oh shoot, the pages are not numbered. So, oh, just a second. Uh, no, the pages are not numbered, so I will have to count them for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It is on page eleven, paragraph three. And Katie, can you clarify what document that is again, please? That is B dash one dash A dash I I dash GBCS Pursuits Tomogamy 2022 Trustee Package 19 pages. Okay. So was, just just for clarification, that was only in reference. This um, this package was because this is a summative trip. This package in, um, was um, was used for a number of the trips. That was only uh, inclusive. That one statement was only inclusive of the, of the Lake Eugenia canoe trip. Um, that if they completed, they had to complete the the swim test while wearing a PFD. In that case, um, that was for a, an earlier trip. That's not for the Tomogamy trip. They have to pass the the this the swim test for the Tomogamy trip. So just like, sorry, I need to find it again. And it does state in the in the 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 note below that it does say students who do not pass the above swim test or do not have the aforementioned certification must not participate in canoe tripping on the tomogamy canoe trip. And that's a, a good thing. I just want you know as we're waiting for Katie in terms of finding that additional information. Um, you know that if you don't have the qualification, you can still go on the trip, but you wouldn't be imp imp involved in the anything to do with canoeing because I not only would that be discriminatory towards individuals or students who, you know, have do not have the ability to swim, but I can also think about uh, um, other students who have um, who are have ability challenges who might be discriminated against because of that. You know, so they just wouldn't be able to participate in that part, but they can participate in the the actual other parts of of the trips. Um, 
Yeah, yes, and many other things have the contingency, uh, multiple alternatives and contingencies, and that's something to talk about at another time. So at this point, I will simply say thank you for clarifying. I'm... I will acknowledge I am still concerned with this significant number of caveats around a swim test where it should simply say they must complete the swim test and it must be documented. But I will leave it at that for now. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Katie. Um, Trustee Lutz, um, is there any further questions or comments? Okay, I see none, so I'm going to reread the motion that the Blue Water District School Board approve the Georgian Bay Community School students participant participate in the Pursuits Program to Mongate Field Trip from June 14th to the 27th, 2022, contingent that it aligns with the COVID-19 protocols at the time of departure. And I actually don't remember who moved it or seconded because I didn't write it down. Morgan and Atkinson. Thank you, thank you, because I'm not dealing with paper here. And all in favor? And that is carried. And then for the final motion, and thank you very much. Final motion is that the Blue Water District School Board approve sending the Special Education Advisory Committee letters regarding policy program memorandum number 81 and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder to the Minister of Education and Deputy Ministers. And can I have a mover? Thank you very much, Trustee McComb, and seconded by Trustee Atkinson. Is there any further comment or um, question concerning the motion before you? I see none, all in favor? And that is carried and thank you very much. And that is um, the report, Chair. Thank you so much. Make my hand go down. Uh, so our next is the business committee of the whole board uh, from March 1st. So there is one recommendation coming out of that uh, business meeting, but first I invite Trustee Dawson to speak to the report and we'll put the report on the floor. So could I have a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board, oh, that'll be our motion. So first I'll invite Jim to speak to the report. Thank you. And I will turn my mic off. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Chair uh, Thompson, the uh, um, business committee of the whole board met on uh, Tuesday, March 1st. Excuse me, I just called up the wrong form here. Give me a sec to call that in. Sometimes I do not like computers very much. Here we go. And uh, there was uh, one item for decision that came out of that meeting and several items for information. So I'm going to go through the items for information first and then I'll do the items for decision. Um, there was uh, an update on the capital priorities program um, on three business cases that were submitted as part of the 2021-22 capital priorities program, which were not approved. And there was also a report on the 2022-23 Capital Priorities Program outlining um, the Capital pro pro Priorities Program for the upcoming year. We also received a report on the COVID-19 HVAC and ventilation in the schools, was an update for March. And there's also a transportation update um, that was received for the year 2021-22. And we also received a report regarding school flight poles. And the recommendation uh, um, is that the, um, excuse me, no, where, where is that? I don't see the recommendation. I wonder if somebody could help me out there, please. You're muted, Jane. That was my phone. 
Superintendent, I did have a question on the report, Tim, and then I'll put the motion on the or the motion on the floor. Okay. Um, the recommendation. The the capital projects that we were turned down for, do we identify that or um, put a media release out to the communities that would be looking forward to those capital projects being approved? Do they know somehow? I believe that uh, Jamie did that on a media release. I think I saw it there. But okay. uh, it was just a report that they were not approved. Okay. Maybe Superintendent Cummings could speak to that. Uh, certainly. Uh, we do reach out to the um, proponents who are involved in that with us. In terms of the immediate release, I don't know for sure. Uh, but we do know that we reached out to the municipalities and those partners who were involved in those projects. Um, and as you as I mentioned at the business committee, it was uh, uh, the conversations were two. One, we didn't get it last time and we're going forward with it again this time. Uh, so they, uh, they're they quite aware of that. Of course, we have the business committees in public forums, so that's uh, perfectly available to the public. Uh, we do have the agenda and the minutes on our website uh, for people to go back and take a look at it any time as well. Thank you. No, I just think uh, in the communities that are highly affected by that, they'll be paying close attention and we should make sure we are. Our communications officer does share that information. Publicly. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I will put the motion on the floor if that's OK with you, Trustee Dawson. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, there was the one recommendation coming out of the business committee of the whole board meeting held on March 1st. Uh, and I'm looking for a mover and a seconder for the following. That Blue Water District School Board approve the list of schools with available unused space that could be made available for appropriate community partnerships. It's moved by Trustee Dawson and seconded by Trustee Atkinson. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Uh, there next is the report from the committee of the board, uh, committee of the whole board in camera meeting from March 22nd, and there was none, so there is no report. And are there any new notice of motion tonight? I see none. Uh, which takes us to our trustee election 2022. Um, and I would like to invite uh, Director Wilder to speak to this. Um, and there's going to be three recommendations coming out of that. So I'll let Director Wilder uh, say her report and then we'll put the motions on the floor separately. Thank you, Chair Thompson. So before each general election, uh, every board of trustees determines the number of trustee positions on their board and distributes these positions across the board's area of jurisdiction. This process is known as trustee determination and distribution. By March 31st of an election year, school boards are required to complete the determination and distribution report showing their calculations. And for this year, submit to the Ministry of Education by April 4th, 2022. The process plays an important role in ensuring that representation on school boards is democratic and fair. As a result of the amendments to the Education Act, the number of elective trustees in each board was set at the number determined for the 2006 regular election. The number of trustees for our board has been set at nine. So calculations are based on the population of electoral group, also known as PEG, and it's a report received from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation in February of 2022. The ministry provides a web-based calculator to assist with trustee distribution <laughs> and determination calculations. School boards whose area of jurisdiction includes more than one municipality must pass a resolution by March 31st either designating one or more municipalities as low population municipalities or declaring that no such designation will be made. The number of low population areas does not affect the total number of trustees for the board. 
As per Regulation 412, the following principles are considered. Municipalities with low population should receive reasonable representation. Evidence of historic, traditional, or geographic community should be taken into account and should not deviate from the principle of representation by population. The recommendations coming forward this evening for consideration do not suggest reducing the number of elected trustees. So the attached trustee distribution chart one, it's appendix one, demonstrates the distribution of our nine trustees based on the electoral group population in each municipality in Bruce and Gray counties. The attached trustee distribution chart two combines municipalities for representation. This has been done on the basis of geographic proximity and the sum of electoral quotients for the combined area, approximating a whole number. The distribution of Blue Water trustees is identical to that determined for the elections in 2006, 2010, 2014, and 2018, as the electoral, electoral quotients have changed very little over that time. Just some key dates for the 2022 elections for consideration. The beginning of the nomination and campaign period is May 1st, 2022. But noting May 1st is a Sunday, so May 2nd would be the first date clerk's offices would be open to accept nominations. The last day for filing nominations and withdrawal of candidacy is August 19th, 2022 at 2 p.m. The voting day is October 24th, 2022, and the official term of office begins November 15th, 2022. So the recommendations below have been provided for your consideration. And then a copy of our completed determination and distribution report will be sent to the minister and school board election clerks for all municipalities within the area of jurisdiction of the board as required by Ontario Regulation 412. So I'll turn it back to Chair Thompson uh, in terms of the recommendations. Before I go to the recommendations, um, thank you for the report, Director Wilder. Do trustees have any questions? Is that all clear to you or do you have anything that you would like to ask? Trustee Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I have gone from five schools to two schools because of bills and closings and stuff like that. But the one school that I don't quite understand was that I had um, Sydenham School, which is inside Owen Sound, I understand. And the new school, Eastridge, is still inside the Own Sound boundary. However, a lot of those children are children from the Meaford area. Can I have some kind of clarification on that, please? Thank you. Director Wilder. So uh, your, it is all based again on electrical quotient. And so the schools for Trustee Morgan are in the municipality of Meaford and the town of the Blue Mountains. So those are where your schools are in terms of the municipality. The city of Owen Sound uh, is the, another municipality which does include Eastridge School. So that is then um, with uh, Trustee Miller. Any other questions that people have? I don't see any. So I'm going to put, there are three recommendations uh, coming out of that. Uh, Trustee Miller. Jennifer go Miller. Go ahead. Hi, I think, I think from a, just looking from a situation, Sydenham School actually is closer to downtown Owen Sound than Eastridge is. Um, very slightly. Um, so I think Fran's question is, if you look at it from a geographic perspective, why would Sydenham, who's never been in the township of Sensually of Meaford, be included as her part of her catchment um, and Eastridge not? I think that's part of the, the confusion, which is reasonable. Sorry. 
Thank you. That's exactly right. Thank you. So if I may, um, Sydenham School doesn't exist anymore. So we have East Ridge, which in terms of the way the electrical or electoral quotient is determined, they have deemed it to be in the city of Owen Sound. And that's why the school is attached there. So formally, if I may, so formally then I guess my question then is the the, the school that was previous to East Ridge, was that in Owen Sound or was that in Meaford? I know, Fran. I <laughs> <laughs> Historically, like I, if I may speak as a parent, I know I lived in Sydenham Township and my children attended Sydenham School and we were attached with Meaford Municipality. So I can see the confusion that is being suggested this evening. And I can't really respond to that other than I know that at this point in time, Eastridge is deemed to be in the city of Owen Sound. So, but I can certainly understand the confusion on that one. Well, and certainly as far as the geographical maps are concerned, it is in Owen Sound. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that, mm -hmm. but thank you. Trustee Lutz. Thank you. I was just going to just to add a point of interest, given the conversation, there are quite a few families and students who live in the municipality of King Carden that are in the school boundaries for schools in Soggy Shores. And um, it has been this way for quite a quite a long time. And honestly, it's something we all just laugh about, about how they, they vote for the trustee in King Carden, but they contact me as their trustee for schools. And it, it's one of those things we all just treat as a little, you know, fluke, fluke of the system and um, ca carry on with life. So it isn't unique to any single municipality. I am sure it exists everywhere um for lots of different reasons so yeah i just wanted to add that it, it is not unique to any single municipality thank you thank you trustee johnstone yes and just to bring bring that to even a, you know a higher part is that you know and i'm sure there's other schools that are what we consider border schools so i have a I represent um, the the community and in, in of uh, here in Kinloss with the Lucknow School. And generally speaking, those kids when they are going into secondary attend uh, FA Middle in Wingham, which is a totally different board. So I have, you know, so I'm good friends um, with the trustee who uh, represents that that school in in Wingham, and so she represents. So she gets calls from people in my area you know, from luck now and concerning um, their student concerns. So I think it's just something that happens and we just uh, we go with with the geographic location of the school as opposed to where students would attend. And thank you very much, Trustee Lutz, for taking care of the students that live in my area, but attend <laughs> your school. Thank you. I'm glad people weighed in because it's you are the ones on the ground that pay attention to what this means. Uh, Director Wilder. I just wanted to point out one other aspect from the trustee distribution chart number two. So even though trustee Morgan uh, has two schools, you actually have the largest electoral quotient at 1.2, which means you have the biggest population that you are serving in the area that you represent. So of all the trustees, you have the largest quotient. <laughs> so I'm gonna put these three recommendations on one at a time. I'll be looking for a mover and a seconder for each of them. The first is that Blue Water District School Board determines that no area within the board's jurisdiction is considered a low population area for election purposes. Could I have a mover and a seconder?
and uh, Tracy Atkinson. And just before we vote on it, because I've isolated it, does anyone have any specific questions about that? That one. OK, so all in favor. Thank you, that's carried. Our second is that the Blue Water District School Board does not voluntarily reduce the number of trustees to be elected below the number provided for in the Act and Ontario Regulation 412-00 in the election of 2022. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder? I see Trustee McComb and Trustee Dawson. And again, if there's any questions about that specific issue, let me know. Trustee Johnston, did you have a question or are you just keen to vote? Just keen to vote. All right, all in favor? Thank you, that is carried. And Bev had a question on our first recommendation. It was Trustee McComb and Trustee Atkinson. And our third recommendation is that the Blue Water District School Board approve the trustee determination of nine trustees and the trustee distribution. See Appendix 1, Chart 2, contained in the trustee election 2022 trustee determination and distribution report. I see Trustee Dawson as a mover and a seconder. Trustee Atkinson, questions? All in favor? Thank you, that is carried. So we're to our reports for information and our student senate report. I'd like to invite a uh, student trustee, Gabe Rossiter to present our report this evening. Hey everybody. Um, can I just make sure that you guys can hear me? Okay, just a little thumbs up. We can. Up. Yep, that's great. Thank, thank you, Chair Thompson. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to present the Student Center report this evening. Over the past few weeks, the Senate has been busy with many new and exciting items. At our meeting on March first, the Senate discussed planning their prom at their high school, which is something that many of us are looking forward to. Some of the high schools have a venue picked out already and a possible date for it to be held on. As some restrictions have eased, students are extremely glad to have the return of clubs and teams to their school. High school students have also received their interim report cards, which gives students an opportunity to see how they are progressing so far. As many of the graduating students have applied for post-secondary, there have been some acceptances among the Senate. This is, this is an exciting time for graduating students, and it will not be long before they will be headed off to their post-secondary institute. Grade eights will be starting to tour the high schools across the board. The Senate discussed their involvement among the tours, which was excellent to hear. Students have also wrapped up their course elections for high school. This is an important yet fun task to do for planning for their future. As the March break is wrapped up, students have had a well-deserved break. During today's meeting, the Senate discussed the provincial mask mandate being lifted. The Senate found that there was a range from 10 to 85 percent of students who still choose to wear masks at their high schools. Most importantly, there have been no issues and it all comes down to personal choice. The Senate has continued to end gender-based violence by creating a sexual assault survey to get a better understanding of the situation at their high schools and learn what and where the issues lie. As most of you know, today, the Student Senate orientation took place. It was so nice to see and meet our incumbent Senate, and it brought back many memories for the current senators. As you can tell, the Student Senate has been continually working hard for their schools and has done an amazing job. Thank you for your time, and once again, it is a pleasure to present the Student Senate report tonight. I always appreciate your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Um, do trustees have any questions for Gabe? Trustee McComb. I was just going to thank uh, Gabe for his enthusiastic report too. You can really get into it. That's wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Just a heads up for your group, you kind of raised a question in my mind where everyone's heading. So not tonight, we won't ask you tonight, but uh, in the future for the ones that are being replaced, uh, we'll be keen to know where your next steps are going to be and wish you well. So just so you know and can prepare. So uh, thank you very much. And we are to our staff reports. And the first is uh, we're going to invite a uh, superintendent Lefebvre. And we're going to put on the floor that the Blue Water District School Board received the student e-learning requirement report for information. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Trustee Atkinson and Trustee McComb, thank you. And welcome, Superintendent Lefebvre. Thank you, Chair Thompson. I'm happy to bring you the student e-learning requirement report um, to um, for your information. Um, as you know, online learning and digital literacy are um, important 21st century skills uh, necessary for our graduates who are entering their post-secondary pathways. Um, PPM 167 was just introduced in February, making it mandatory for students to complete two e-learning credits to meet the requirements to graduate with an OSSD or an Ontario Secondary School Diploma. Um, there are a number of um, caveats and, and intricacies to the PPM, and for this I am um, going to be introducing Sarah Slater to you. Um, Sarah Slater it has the longest title in our whole board, so you'll have to pardon me while I read this off of a, off of a note I've got here. Managing Information for Student Achievement, MISA, and Technology Enabled Learning Lead slash Remote Learning Contact. So um, we don't give her a card because we can't actually fit it on a card for her, but um, that's Sarah Slater's title. She um, is excellent at what she does, and uh, I welcome her to, um, to the floor today to uh, present to you all about uh, e-learning requirements for our, for our students. Sarah? Hi, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Keith. The, the thing that's missing in my title is that I'm also responsible for e-learning. We just haven't put it on there because there's not space. So my presentation tonight is about e-learning and I'm just going to share my screen. I hope it would look bad if it doesn't work well for me. Oh, uh, <laughs> it's working. Perfect. Are you seeing the actual slideshow? Or are you still seeing the? Uh, there we go. OK, yep. looks good. OK, so as Keith said, in February, the uh, Ministry of Education came out with PPM 167, which announced a new e-learning graduation requirement for all students working towards their Ontario Secondary School Diploma. E-learning credits will support the development of digital literacy and other transferable skills that will help our students succeed in our ever increasing digital world. So the students impacted by this PPM are all students who entered grade nine from in September 2020 and then all years going forward from that. So it includes our current grade nine and 10 students and specifically those who are working towards their Ontario Secondary School Diploma. They are required to have e-learning credits. Those working towards a certificate are encouraged to complete the e-learning credits, although they're not required for the certificate. So the new requirement is that all students will earn a minimum of two e-learning credits at some point in their secondary school years. So those students who entered grade nine in September 2020 have the added advantage that they can use one of their remote learning credits earned during the school closure period from April to June 2021. So it's only a credit, one credit earned in that um, time period. So the students who were in remote for the entire year or were in remote all of this year will still only be able to count one remote credit. And those students who entered grade nine in September 2021 are required to have a minimum of two e-learning credits. So the definition of e-learning is that the courses are delivered entirely using the internet and the students and educators communicate and share coursework and assessment, all of the information in a virtual learning environment. The virtual learning environment we use in Blue Water for e-learning is Brightspace, which I'm sure you've all heard lots about. 
Students are not required to be physically present with the teacher or other students. In fact, they're not really allowed to be present with the teacher or other students at the time that they're learning. And students follow different timetables than the teachers and other students, so it's not a requirement that they be in a specific period for their e-learning. In Blue Water, the e-learning courses will be teacher led. We will have teachers teaching the courses and providing ongoing feedback, assessment and evaluation and reporting just like they do in person. But all of that happens within Brightspace in the virtual learning environment. So students have to interact with that virtual learning environment on a regular consistent basis. E-learning allows students to access a wider variety of courses often than what is available in their home school. It provides students with an opportunity to collaborate with peers from across Blue Water and also from across the province. Engaging in e-learning will increase digital fluency and will help students gain skills for lifelong learning as well as build skills for employment and post-secondary education. Students in Blue Water have a number of opportunities to access e-learning credits. Blue Water hosts a variety of e-learning courses in the schools within Blue Water and is also a member of the Ontario e-learning consortium, which hosts a wider variety of courses that our students can access. Students can also access dual credit opportunities through Blue Water partnerships with Georgian and Fanshawe colleges. The dual credit opportunities that count as e-learning credits are ones that are delivered entirely online. They don't include the hands-on dual credit opportunities that we also provide for our students. So Blue Water will be increasing the number of grade 11 and 12 e-learning options available to students beginning in the 2022-23 school year. We're developing those options now and they'll be shared with students in April of this year. Students will then be able to choose to replace an already chosen in-person credit with an e-learning credit or they can fill a spare they have requested with an e-learning credit. And space in our Blue Water courses will be priori prioritized for students who require the credits for graduation. As part of PPM 167, students have an opportunity to opt out of the e-learning requirement. This is done with at the request of a parent or guardian or at the student's request if the student is 18 years or older or if they're 16 or 17 and have withdrawn from parental con control. We have a specific administrative form for opting out and those went out with our grade 10 students this week. Specifically our grade 10s because they are the ones who are most impacted by this this year. So they're now looking at that form and deciding whether they want to opt out of the requirement. Thank you, Sarah. And just to um, just to finalize that that thought, the um, the deadline for that to come back is next later next week. So we're giving everyone a two week period so that as a system, uh, we will know how many students are opting out uh, because that helps us to determine how many courses, ELO courses we need to offer within the system next year. And those staffing decisions need to be made in a timely manner. We need to make those uh, decisions and put those uh, suggestions out for students to make decisions in April. Thank you. Do uh, trustees have any questions or comments? Trustee Morgan. Lots of questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a quick question. If um, a student chooses to opt out, does that mean that they opt out of the the whole thing that they that they do not need the credits to graduate, or is that just for, but they have to make it up at a different time? Do you, do you want, want me to answer that, Keith? <laughs> sure, go ahead, Sarah, and I'll jump in where needed. Okay, so when they opt out, they're opting out of the requirement. It doesn't mean that they can't take an ELO course, but it means they're opting out of the requirement for two. So if they then choose to take one, that's fine. And if they choose to take two, then they can obviously opt back in. But they are saying that they are not going to meet the requirement for two ELO courses. Thank you for that. Okay. Trustee Lutz. Thank you. Um, through the chair, I just have a question about the types of courses being offered and I'm 
curious, are they specific specific courses being chosen for e-learning or is it um, the standard secondary courses being offered in e-learning format? I hope that makes sense. Thank you. I, I can take that one too, Keith. So Katie, when I was looking at, um, sorry, Trustee Lutz, when I was looking at uh, the courses that I was making suggestions about, I took a look at the Ontario e-learning e consortium courses that are available this year. I looked at ones that have very long waiting lists in the province, so they're obviously popular e-learning courses. Um, I looked at ones that had high success rates in e-learning. The challenge is a lot of the e-learning courses out there are at the U level, so we're, we're looking at running some C and M, um, courses that that offer more variety but i did look specifically for ones that seemed popular ones that seemed to allow success for students as opposed to just randomly picking courses um, that was that was a lot of my thinking process in in making suggestions for courses and then brightspace also has um, content developed for some courses that teachers can start with that is developed specifically for e-learning. So I was looking at ones that had that available as well so that teachers and students had that advantage to start with that it's it's curriculum that is specifically designed to ensure success in the e-learning environment. Thank yes, you. That's yes. that's sorry. Katie, go ahead. Sorry, I was just saying thank you. That all sounds really, really fantastic and really well researched and designed for our students. So thank you very, very much. Trustee Dawson. Uh, thank you, Chair Thompson. I'm just wondering if you could give us a couple of concrete examples of some of the courses that have been or will be offered. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I didn't have that open. I'm sorry, just give me a second. There I know our business courses, our accounting courses have been yes. very popular and very successful. I know our philosophy course has actually done quite well the last few years, a grade 12 philosophy course. Um, There's also some math courses that work very well. Um, data management in grade 12 works very well in the in the online environment. So that one is is one that we um, will continue to provide. Good, thank you. It's never where you want it to be. No. I have a couple of questions for you. We Last year, we heard about um, the ministry potentially looking to TVO to offer our online courses. And I'm hearing you suggest that that is through our board and through the consortium. Can you just explain what that would look like for our students? So in, in terms, I'll take this one, Sarah, in terms of the Ontario eLearning Consortium, um, this has actually grown quite a bit over the last year. There have been a number of new boards that have joined the consortium over the last year. Um, we are part of the largest consortium within the province um, and uh, the OELC. And um, what happens is we uh, we use a, a piece of software um, called Prism that allows us to pr um, not pre-register, but um, uh, set up our students um, into courses and allows us to share spaces um, with other boards so that we can fill up spaces that we have within our within our class. So if we if before school starts, we find that we've got 10 empty seats within, let's say, that philosophy class. We can open it up and take 10 students from outside of our board into our philosophy course and maximize the number of seats that we have there. And then we can, in return, um, find 10 seats outside within the province in other boards for our students. So there may be some very small, uh, specific requests that our students have within the system looking for courses outside in other boards. They might be taking uh, courses in Ottawa 
um, Peterborough or anywhere in the within the province that is part of the consortium. It's worked quite well for us. It's really helped us to maximize our number of seats within our summer school program. Um, it's been um, it's been quite positive. We've had a, a very good experience in the last two years with the OELC. Uh, and my follow up question, it's a little bit different, but I've always been a big supporter of our small schools and I who don't have a full range of curriculum because of the number of students that they have. This feels like a win for them. And in some respects, I assume our small our students from our small schools are already benefiting because they've had to take online courses to meet their needs all the way along. Um, so unusually, they're in a probably an advantaged situation in this than some of our students. But is this is this growing the opportunities for our small schools to uh, have more opportunity for the students? It is growing the, the amount of it's growing the e-learning opportunities that we have within the board. So we are going to be enhancing and, in, and, and increasing the number of courses next year and very likely the year after that. Um, so you'll see the number of e-learning courses that we're offering within the system um, to 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 be um, quite a bit quite a bit greater than it has been in the past. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think our students in our small schools have probably already benefited from e-learning and they I don't think many of them will have a lot of difficulty meeting the ELO requirements, um, except what um, Sarah re referenced just a few minutes ago with respect to M courses and other courses other than the the college okay. uh, the college pathway university pathway a lot of the courses are university pathway we really have to um, focus and make sure that we offer enough opportunities for students following multiple pathways um, so that's going to be our that's going to be one of our challenges that we're really going to have to uh, make sure that we choose the right courses right instructors um, to be in front of the students um, to help them be successful. I was going to add a little bit to to what Keith has said just to, from the from the principal perspective and working with the ELO teachers this year. I haven't had the opportunity to work with a lot of ELO teachers and and working with teachers and people in my role across the province. It's really heartening to see how often teachers reach out about their ELO students, whether they're from our board or from another board to say, you know, they're concerned about their engagement in the course. They're concerned about their attendance, which isn't really. It's not actually face to face attendance, but how often they're accessing the course and how much work they're getting done. So choosing the right instructors is is really crucial. Certainly the people I have seen this year reaching out about their ELO students and then there's the communication between the boards about students who might be struggling and trying to get them back on track. These these students that they've never met in person, but they have that same concern that they do for their in person students. It is really heartening to see that and and gives me some hope that going forward with students who have not really been successful with ELO type courses that we can we can have that success still. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments? I always think if the students and students listening um, appreciated the amount of effort that goes into uh, trying to ensure their success, um, it's it's remarkable, and it's uh, that's why we're all here sitting at this. Uh, table tonight. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Uh, it was moved by Trustee Atkinson, second by Trustee McComb, that the Blue Water District School Board receive the student e-learning requirement report for information. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. And we're to our school update report, so I welcome again Superintendent Elliott, and I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to put the Blue Water District School Board receive the blue uh, the update report for information. I see Trustee Morgan. And someone else. Trustee Atkinson, thank you very much. 
and welcome Superintendent Elliott. Good evening again. It's my pleasure to begin the school update report and I will be followed by Superintendents Lefebvre and Cummings. And as uh, Chair Thompson and student trustee Rossiter mentioned, staff and students have returned from a well-deserved March break and we're looking forward to planning activities and uh, ensuring student success in a safe environment between now and the end of the school year. And uh, as you know, there's been a comprehensive update in school protocols due to changes um, in ministry guidance that was released on March 9th, just before the March break. Uh, they do love to do that. Um, and I just would like to share some of the key points. So I'll start with some of the things that are no longer going to be occurring in schools, and then I'll, I'll continue with the things that are continuing in schools. So I hope that that's a helpful way to uh, share the information. So uh, some of the things that are no longer continuing is the vaccination disclosure policy, which was revoked for all sectors, including education. And uh, as you know, masks are no longer required by student staff and visitors in schools, um, but uh, they are still provided by the Ministry of Education. And as you heard um, from student trustee Rossiter, um, the, the student Senate felt that anywhere from 10 to up to 85% of uh, students and staff were wearing masks and I did do a survey informally of my schools today and I was getting between 10 and 50 percent of people opting to wear a mask so I think we'll see that that will continue and um, we also um, you'll notice that there are some circumstances where masks are required one is if uh, you have participated in international travel uh, you then have to mask for a two-week period and then uh, there are other cases when you do the online screener which is still required um, there are circumstances for instance if there's someone positive in your household and you are able to attend school you still need to mask so there are a few uh, cohorting and social distancing are no longer required in schools and there are no longer limitations on in-person gatherings or assemblies uh, and the, the ministry has requested that we encourage uh, hosting in-person events such as proms, graduations, and assemblies. So some of the things that are remaining in school that I think are still very important layers of protection, uh, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. So there continues to be signage throughout the schools on uh, how to engage in proper hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. And then, um, we also have all of our um, enhanced cleaning protocols still continue uh, uh, in all of our schools and work sites. So those are the key points and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have before I pass on to Superintendent Lefebvre or Superintendent Cummings. Thank you kindly. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I had one question for you. Sure. Um, I know that you had regular meetings with our public health unit. Are we continuing to have those meetings? Dr. R has stopped sending us his um, daily reports and things seem to have just kind of, um, you know, kind of returned to normal. I just wonder what that looks like yeah. from a school board public health relationship. Yeah, long before COVID, we had a very strong relationship with public health. It has always been part of uh, my uh, my uh, portfolios. So we work with public health around things like dental screening, around your traditional vaccines. Um, they come into our schools as regular speakers in areas such as things like vaping and uh, other programs to in the areas of public health. So COVID took over our relationship a little bit and forced maybe a little bit more uh, meetings, but uh, I, I anticipate that we'll continue to meet very regularly about our uh, traditional public health programming in schools. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think Superintendent Lefebvre, are you next? Yes, thank you. Um, I have to say I was in schools today for some visits and um, the kindergarten students were especially happy to be at their sand tables and um, because they haven't been able to do that for a long time. So they were actually, they were super excited to show me their sand tables and water tables and things like that. So very exciting. Um, thank you very much, Superintendent Elliott. I have one quick update and that's around remote school. And um, as you know, the ministry um, is, um, is requiring us to offer a remote school option for students again next year. Um, 
Uh, we are going to be sending information home later this week, um, asking people to make a decision. The decision will need to be made uh, prior to April 8th. We're asking for people to uh, give us their decision by April 8th so that we can make some staffing decisions. Um, it's really imperative that uh, we make staffing decisions at the right time um, so that we don't have to reorganize classrooms, disrupt students, um, and um, uh, again, re reorganize schools. Um, we, we've experienced that a number of times over the last few years. We've had some unusual reorganizations. We'd like to um, um, have a, as normal a, a year as possible. And in order for that to take place, uh, we really require those numbers to come in. And we're asking people to make that decision for the full school year. Um, and seeing that we're back to um, a situation where we're a little more back to normal, um, uh, we feel it's very fair asking people to make that decision now um, uh, before April 8th about the uh, for next year, what uh, um, what they ant anticipate or plan to have their students um, do in terms of learning remotely or learning in person. I have some numbers here just to highlight where we've been at with respect to remote learning over the course of the last year. Um, I thought people might find that um, interesting. Um, at the start of uh, last year, we had 1,750 or approximately 10% of our student population in remote school. Um, at the end of last year, we had 1,300 or approximately 7.4% of our student population in remote school. At the start of this school year, we had approximately 350 or up approximately 2% of our student population in remote school. And currently we're at 310 or 1.7% of our student population. So we have been steadily declining uh, in terms of uh, the number of students who are opting for remote learning. And um, that's uh, my report for you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I see a question from Trustee Johnstone. Yes, thank you. And thank you, um, Superintendent Lafay, for answering the question before I had to ask it. And that was concerning uh, the, the basically the timeline around um, the enrollment for on, online uh, learning. I wanted to see what it was like over time. Mm -hmm. And so I actually, uh, I'm glad about the trend line. Yeah. Um, so I my 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 next question would be, and I just want it um, confirmed because we're in a board meeting. Is um, what kind of funding do we get as a board in terms of our online school? Um, that is a a good question. We have received funding um, to help support um, to support online schooling over the course of the the pandemic. Um, I don't have exact figures right in front of me, and I don't know. Um, I I don't want to put a, a colleague on the spot, and I don't know if anyone else has the, those that number right in front of them. Um, however, um, we have been provided funding to help offset some of the costs associated with uh, remote learning, especially the additional hiring of staff that we've had to make over the course of the last year and a half. OK, um, thank you. I, I just I just know I remember hearing that they weren't going to be, you know, that they might be supporting certain things, but they weren't supporting, say, the infrastructure or something. And I, I just wanted to know exactly what that was. Um, and I just wondered if the director or um, uh, Superintendent Cummings knew about that. It could say that bring more information concerning exactly what gets funded on on online schooling and what doesn't. Well, we are funded just um, just based on the, the numbers themselves. Uh, the students generate the funding through the GSN. Mm -hmm. So when we have 20, 20 students in a primary classroom um, that we've been able to uh, put together and offer in a remote learning environment, um, that is that does tend to that funds a, a, a teacher to be able to support mm -hmm. that classroom. OK, thank you. I'll find and out. There are some additional learning recovery funds that have been allotted for next year as well to help offset some of those costs as well associated with remote learning. OK, thank you. Director Wilder. 
good question, Trustee Johnstone. I know too that there have been, so we, we as you know, our first year, we ran actual remote schools. And it was a concern about funding because we had to fund at that time um, administrators and OPT, like office staff to support the schools. We then with our decreased numbers, significantly decreased numbers, we moved away from having a school, which I think was easier from a financial point of view because as uh, Superintendent Lefebvre had said, the GSN generated the funding, but we still had some office professional requirements and I know Thank goodness. So Sarah Slater, who just presented to all of you, she picked up um, a big chunk of uh, supporting our remote learning. So thank goodness for her because she helped coordinate so much of that. But, you know, it has been stressful for boards to offer this as an option and it continues to be stressful. And we in our communications have been clear with families that our preference for the best learning for students is that face to face option. Uh, because it just it's presented stresses in lots of different ways. So I don't have specifics, but I know I think even next year they had um, put some money in again for if you had office professional type responsibilities, they there's some money allocated for next year, even even a portion of an administrator if you needed to do that. So the government has recognized, I think, that we do need to support it or have the, the boards need support financially to make this operationalized. And thank you very much. And uh, yes, and I remember that from the first year. And, and I know that they said that we had a, a offer online next year. And I was concerned about if we actually were getting, you know, any, you know, getting funding for it because, you know, sometimes they'll say you must offer a program, but we don't actually get funded for it. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Lutz. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I want to acknowledge that I understand how complicated and hard it is to provide things that don't necessarily come with a packet of funding from the government. And I also want us all to consider um, the language we are using when discussing things like online learning, as I have heard from many individuals that the opportunity for online learning has been um, incredibly beneficial to the educational opportunities for many individuals with um, with needs that make traditional um, or not traditional, just schooling in a brick and mortar building challenging. And so we should be really, really careful when we use phrases even like it's our strong preference or things like that, because we don't know we don't know what all the challenges everyone else is dealing with. And we we need to make sure we are being inclusive and 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 accepting of all of the students in our school board and that we we want to show our commitment to providing all of them the best educational opportunities we can. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? And I think we have uh, Superintendent Cummings next. Thank you, Chair Thompson. Um, I'm going to speak to you about the uh, community use of schools, which is now in, uh, I'd like to say full swing, but it's certainly in full booking swing. So as of Monday, uh, it opened back up. <clears throat> Our permit coordinator is quite busy with uh, scheduling and processing um, numerous calls uh, and requests for use of school space. Uh, the feedback that I got from them this morning uh, is that our users are quite enthusiastic, quite excited. In fact, their comments to me made it sound a lot like Superintendent Lefebvre's experience in the kindergarten room. Um, kids are very excited as are our uh, community users are very excited uh, to get back into our schools. Uh, so it's all going very well. They've uh, they have processed numerous permits already and uh, are continue to remain busy. So it's great. Uh, that's. That basically sums up community use of schools at this point in time. 
happy to take any comments or, or questions on the topic. Chair Thompson. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? I don't see any. I just wanted to uh, let the trustees know uh, generally on a Tuesday afternoon, Minister Lecce meets with us to uh, have a meeting with directors and chairs. He's cancelled it the last two weeks in a row. So when you didn't receive a, uh, a report today, uh, that's the reason why. And um, and the minister often makes it sound very simple for students to transfer from in person to online, and it's not. Um, Director Wilder points that out to me on a regular basis. We are staffed at a certain level and we just don't have a lot of space that's sitting there empty for someone to transfer. And but he that doesn't come across in the messaging that we receive. If that's what parents want, they can have it. So um, I just wanted to fill you in on those two pieces. Uh, apparently we're back on target for a meeting next Tuesday. So we'll watch for your update from the meeting from there. And I'm glad to hear that we're back open for business with our community, so that's exciting news. It was moved by Trustee Morgan, seconded by Trustee Atkinson, that the Blue Water District School Board received the school update report for information. All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Um, we have no correspondence that's been received, so we're down to communications announcements from our student trustees, trustees, staff. Um, are there any announcements? OPSPA, Trustee Johnstone. Yeah, I, I guess I was trying to figure out whether I would do it here, uh, Trust Chair Thompson, or in the next in the next uh, yeah, uh, yeah. line on the agenda. So that's why I hesitated there. So um, I, I can start with that. There is a labor conference coming up. It's by Zoom. It's April 28th. Um, and it goes from, I believe, 8.30 in the morning to 3.30. And you would have received an invitation if you decide to register. Um, you would have received just either today or yesterday that um, from um, it, uh, TJ that OPSPA Regional Western meeting. It is again by Zoom and that is going to be on Saturday, April 9th and that goes from 9 to 11 a.m. in the morning. So it's only like a, a Zoom meeting, you know, like anybody in our region could attend and actually they're quite worthwhile. You know, it's two hours, but you get to connect with trustees from um, right across the, we the western region and oftentimes um, you know it's, it's very interesting to find out what other boards are doing. Um, you would have also received um, from Carla Gar Garbaz on Monday so she does what's called the OPSPA Connects and I just am going to put something up on my screen so it helps me. Um, Anyway, I'm just looking. Oh, it was actually in the wrong place. But she does OPSPA Connect, for example. And um, so she, she, um, for example, she said, um, she taught, and I'll do a little bit more on that, but it's a call for nominations for OPSPA elected positions 2022. And you would have received, um, and you will receive this because I asked Bev to send it to all of you, is actually the forms to do that and what position. So if you want to be the president of OPSPA, you can actually, um, you know, um, here's your throw, chance. Yeah, here's your big chance. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, also, though, of interest in, in something, and I'm thinking about Trustee Morgan here and the letter we wrote uh, uh, OPSPA recently, but there is a call for policy resolutions and constitutional amendments. So I'm wondering if um, if I work with you, uh, Trustee Morgan, as we do a motion from our board, and that's concerning, um, um, you know, um, your idea that you we. And I'm just I just lost my mind there, but it was your About idea. About the business cases. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. So we're gonna. If you don't mind, if I can phone you and we can put together something in a resolution so that that can actually go to the AGM. 
So it has oh, to do absolutely. with absolutely building schools to actually the, the size that's actually needed. OK, but so when I know you, it'll be, well, and just to let you know, I know there's a lot of support right across the province for that. So I think that it's a winner. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, OK, and I'm just going to I'm weak. I'm weakling and wobbling here. So yes, yeah, since then there's the OPSPAS awards and if so, they're looking for nominations and there's a bunch of other things then there. Um, and I'm just now I go to go back to my little pieces of paper here and then the last one and because where those motions and um, and also where those elections happen. Um, is going to be at the 2022 AGM, and that is June 9th to 11. It is going to be at the Western Hotel in Ottawa from, from Thursday to a Saturday. So it will actually be an in-person, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity for, for trustees. And um, that's my basically my report, and I'll gladly take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? I have one question for you, Trustee Johnstone. Um, when we had to, Rusty Hicks sent a message out asking if we were interested in attending the AGM in person for their planning purposes. And I must say at the time I was feeling, and I maybe still am, I'm not sure I want to travel to Ottawa. It's my first outing in the last two years. But if we were to change our mind, do you know if there's a deadline when we have to uh, declare that? Yes, there's always a deadline. Now I'd have to find out exactly when it is, and it could actually be like a month before, you know. Um, and if Bev's online, and I mean, because we've had this situation before where people have registered for, say, uh, you know, whether it was PES or AGM, and for some reason couldn't attend. Um, so I don't know if Bev's not on there, but I, I do know that ha it's quite a lengthy time beforehand. So, okay. you know, like if it's this three days before, they can't really do anything um, about that. About that, Of course, your hotel is, is different because that's not done through OPSPA. That's actually done through the hotel. But my always my suggestion to people if they're booking a hotel is do it early because you can you can because they um, will set aside a, a number of rooms for OPSPA. OK, and if you're not in there, then they let those rooms go. So it's all actually better to book ahead of time. And then with them, it's like usually it's 24 hours. You can cancel. Thank you, Thank you very much. You make it oh. sound so interesting. I start to question myself. <laughs> Don't worry. I mean, <laughs> I just just to let you know, I have a board of directors meeting coming up. In uh, in Toronto, it'll be my first big outing in two years, <laughs> and I, you know, and so I trust. I talked to Trustee Johnstone Jr. because we often share a room, and I said, "Do you want me to book?" <laughs> so, you know, it's a exciting. It's well, it's exciting and scary at the same time. I'm just gonna say. Anyway, there you go. Excellent. Any other? Uh, so we're at conference. Well, we've talked about conferences. Is uh, Trustee Johnstone said. Um, any other announcements, conferences, messages you want to share? Uh, so our trustee calendar of events, I know it's getting shorter and shorter, so please pay attention to it. I, and uh, Trustee Johnstone. I have another one. Yeah, yes. there is. Sorry about that. There That's is. Okay. Um, it's. Um, the Canadian School Boards Association is coming up and I believe that's in. I'm trying to think. I know it's always in July. And it's usually sometime in the first week of July, and I believe it's also in person this year and it's in beautiful downtown Saskatoon. So wow. <laughs> yeah, I thought maybe but, they were combined again. Well, you know, they we have done that in the past and it's always really a good thing. But anyway, um, but that's coming up and I have no idea if they're kind of doing a hybrid model or not. Excellent. How's that? So I'll, when I find out more, I'll let you know. Thank you. So I think uh, we are to adjournment. 
So if I could have a mover and a seconder that the Blue Water District School Board adjourn at 8.45 p.m. I see Trustee Johnstone and Trustee Dawson, and I don't suppose there's anyone opposed, but all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Stay Good well. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.